Hi, how are you today? It's uh, good to see you, although I'm not really seeing you in person, but um, I'm coming via this uh, new format uh, to share the Dharma, share the teachings, and to celebrate the birthday of Shinran Shoni. Uh, this talk is being sponsored by the Tsukiji Hongganji in Tokyo. And as you may know, uh, once a month we hold an English service uh, at the temple. However, because of the extraordinary situation, i.e. the corona pandemic, uh, we have had to change our format so that um, we can still celebrate the birthday of Shinran Shoni uh, through this medium. So I hope that uh, you are doing well, and hopefully that uh, we can, as we spend the next uh, 40 minutes or so, um, you will be able to find a little time to reflect on what is going on and to think a little bit deeply about our situation. A situation which is not an easy one for all of us because our lives have been turned upside down. The plans that we had had been canceled and we had to adjust to a new situation. This is exactly what Buddhism teaches us, that changes come often not in the way that we want. In fact, not uh, so that we need to have a mental framework, a way of understanding to adjust to that change. So in a way, this is an opportunity for us to practice the Dharma, the teachings, so that we can uh, accept, deal, confront, adjust to the change, so that we do, we do not become unduly um, disappointed, un unduly saddened by the situation. Today is uh, Shinran Shonin's birthday, or we are celebrating Shinran Shonin's uh, birth, which took place um, 1273, I, I'm sorry, 1173, and he passed away in 1263. So he lived for 90 long years, and so it's been 847 years since he was born, a very, very long time. And since then, there have been millions of people who have been inspired by his teachings, have um, become members of the various organizations that are dedicated to the study and the propagation and furtherance of Shinran's teachings. So, on this occasion of his birthday, I wanted to, I would like to uh, give a Dharma talk entitled A Picture Book When the Bluebird Sings by Noriko. And the subtitle is A Shin Buddhist Appreciation of Inferiority Complex in All of Us. So the subtitle has a, the theory or, of inferiority complex. This is not so much a Buddhist term, term, as you can tell. It is more a psychological term. And so I will also bring up uh, a well-known psychology psychologist by the name of Alfred Adler, an Austrian. Uh, psychotherapist, uh, a psychologist, uh, a, a, phys a doctor uh, who left some important teachings on inferiority complex. Well, let's get back to Shinran Shonin to begin with. Have you ever wondered um, if Shinran Shonin had an inferiority complex? Uh, often we see him as this you know, great figure, uh, 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 someone that we look up to, and we all look up to. 
I, I too, of course. Um, I taught for 20 years at a university called the Musashino University in Tokyo. And in the front entrance of the university, there is a magnificent uh, statue of Shinwan-shun. It's him, uh, it's a statue of him at the age of about 61 or 62, when he is about to um, leave Kanto area to go back to Kyoto to continue his studies and propagation work. What, what always impressed me about that statue was that he has an air of confidence and determination. And you can feel this sense of energy. And, uh, and so um, it's hard for me to think that he had an inferiority complex. However, um, we, everyone, this is the first message for today is that everyone at one time in life experiences a sense of inferiority. And I don't think that Shinran was an exception. And of course, we often don't talk about that, but in looking at his life, you know, he lost his parents when he was a young child. By the time he got ordained at the age of nine, he, was, uh, he didn't have his mother or father. Just imagine at a young age, not to have his parents. It must have been a source of a feeling of sadness, sense of hollowness, and a sense of inferiority. When compared to other kids, other children, that he probably felt a sense of inferiority because he didn't have not only just one, but both parents. That may have been one of the reasons why he decided to become a monk, a priest, at a very young age. That is on a personal level, but on a kind of a um, existential or spiritual level, he had a deep sense of impermanence, sense of change, often change that you don't want to see. There is a famous poem that he is um, attributed with, the poem when he was ordained, on the night that he was ordained, he supposedly, well, he is supposed to have written a poem about a cherry blossom tree in the yard of the temple. And it was in full bloom, and it was a beautiful sight to see, but he pondered whether at night and in the morning, whether these blossoms will still be there because there is a chance that a storm may come and scatter these blossoms away. So he, always, he, he was a sensitive person who felt a deep, uh, sadness or instability, which, um, it, which I feel we can call as a sense of inferiority. So suffering inferiority that he had it on both the personal and on the existen existential level. This is the theme uh, that is depicted or talked about in this picture book that I am about to share with you. It's called When the Blue Bird Sings by Noriko. Uh, Noriko, um, and by the way, she spells it N-O-R-Y-C-O. Often, usually it's Noriko, a Japanese uh, name, is often spelled N-O-R-I-K-O, but here, she spells it N-O-R-Y-C-O, Noriko. She's actually a wife of a priest uh, uh, who is a ministering in Brazil as a priest of the Shin Buddhist denomination. So uh, she, she uh, produced this wonderful uh, picture book uh, with um, 
the words written in Japanese and also in English. So I want to share with you this wonderful story. Um, and so allow me to share that story with you. So excuse the little technical um, intervention here. And um, so, when the bluebird sings by Air Noriko. Deep in the forest, there lived a beautiful bluebird. And here he is, flying through the, the sky over the, the, the forest. The bluebird was very proud of its own beauty. When the flying, when flying through the forest, everyone would say, over there, there's that blue bird, how beautiful it is. And they loud and en they let out an envious sigh. Hey, bluebird, why don't you come and sing with us? His friends called out to him one day, but the bluebird frantically flew away. Gee, I wonder why he flew away. Shoot, what's with him? He's always like this. Fine, let's just forget about him and sing. Always being this way, no one, was, no one has ever heard the bluebird sing. And here's the bluebird at home by himself crying. Why is he crying? And we'll find out now. As the singing of his friends could be heard, alone at home, the bluebird quietly let out a sigh. Oh, how, how I wish I could sing with my friends. But unlike his appearance, his voice was raspy and unpleasant. Since then, the bluebird quietly goes out at dusk, so he wouldn't be seen by his friends. So, to comment a little bit, so here, bluebird is the envy of all his friends because of his beauty. But there was a sense of inferiority that he felt. That inferior feeling came from the fact that he had a terrible voice, but he was afraid to admit and to, sh to share that with his friends. So he couldn't face up to the fact that he was being unfriendly because he didn't want people to know his sense of inferiority. And that was his... Uh, Contrary to his looks, his sense of this um, uh, terrible voice that he felt that he had. Now back to the story. Then one day, out of nowhere, a beautiful voice singing Buposo was heard. What a beautiful voice, the bluebird in search of the owner of that beautiful voice, search the forest. So this voice, this sound, buposo, which by the way in Japanese refers to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, buposo. And so this beautiful voice that could be heard throughout the forest um, came to his attention. Buposo, buposo. But of course, that voice was also heard by the bluebird's friends in the forest. 
blue pozo. Because the bluebird was always flying when the beautiful voice was heard, his friend thought that it was the bluebird's voice. So you see that it, bluebird knew that it wasn't his voice, but uh, his friends that it was his because they had never heard his voice. One day the bluebird once again went out in search of the voice. Just then his friends called out, hey bluebird, you sure sing with an amazing voice. We heard you, it was a, a great voice. We could hear Puposo, it's so lovely as they flew by. So they praised, they thought that the voice was the bluebirds. And here's, oh no, thought the bluebird. Oh no, oh no. What shall I do? That's not me. That isn't my voice. Buposo, buposo. Their voice could be heard from far, far away. The bluebird quickly flew in the direction of the voice. Quietly at dusk, the bluebird would go out in search of the voice. Singing, the bluebird flying around about, his friends began calling him Buposo. The bluebird did not feel bad as he thought to himself, that's not true. So here that it wasn't his, for the bluebird, it wasn't his voice, but his friends began, thought that he was, and began to call him Buposo. And on top of that, what is important here is that actually Bluebird felt good. He felt good that people thought or his friends thought that uh, he had a beautiful voice, but he couldn't admit it. So he had this mixed feeling of feeling good that people praised him, but at the same time, he knew that it wasn't true. But feeling embarrassed, it became all the more difficult for the bluebird to go out, that he would go out searching for the owner of the voice only after his friends were fast asleep. It also seemed that the voice could be better heard at night. Buposo. Ah, I found it. Finally, the bluebird found the owner of the voice. It was none other than a big Japanese scops owl. Scops owl. In a raspy voice, the bluebird called out to the scops owl, uh, excuse me. And the scops owl turned around with a gentle look. As their eyes met, the bluebird immediately felt happy, yet ashamed and disappointed in himself and began to cry. The bluebird could not stop crying. Loudly cried the bluebird. The scops owl gently watched over the crying bluebird. Crying, the bluebird said, with such an ugly voice as mine, I can't sing with everyone. My friends are mistaken, thinking that your beautiful voice belongs to me, when my voice is actually this ugly. But here I am, unable to say so. Gently bringing the crying bluebird to his side, in a firm yet beautiful, clear voice, the scops owl said, just as you are. 
just as you are. It is fine, just as you are. I've heard about you, Buposo. What a nice name it is. And your voice, your voice also comforts those who hear it and is a very wonderful voice. That cannot be, said the blue bird, gazing at the scops owl in surprise. Buposo, now listen carefully. I can only fly at night after dark. That is why I would be happy if you would fly during the day. Everyone is happy with you just flying. Then Buposo cried and cried. Buposo was overjoyed and happy for being forgiven and saved. This is the important part, so we'll do it again. Buposo cried and cried. Buposo was overjoyed and happy for being forgiven and saved. This probably was similar to the feeling that Shinran Shonin felt at the age of 29 when he met Honen, his teacher, and Honen said basically the same thing, that you are accepted just as you are. Of course, he didn't, his teacher Honen, Honen Shonin, saying Honen didn't speak in terms of an owl. He spoke in terms of Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha is the Buddha of compassion and wisdom that is constantly reaching out and, and telling us, reminding us that you are fine just as you are. And so when Shinran, uh, after 20 years of struggling to overcome his uh, suffering, his inferiority complex, his, his feelings of inferior, inferiority, he felt relieved. He felt happy. And I'm sure that uh, it, it would, uh, this scene here of the blue bird uh, helps us to kind of appreciate what Shinran Shonin uh, probably experienced when he met Jir Honen and Honen had the message that I just mentioned of the infinite and unlimited compassion, unlimited um, openness and the willingness to accept Shinran just as he is. So let's move on. Since then, Buposa would fly all day from tree to tree, forest to forest. Then at night, he would always go to the Skopsawa's side and listen to his stories. And sharing the stories with his friends the next day, that became part of his daily routine. That voice was a happy one that everyone was thankful for and sharing in the joy with his friends, Buposo came to enjoy being able to sing together with them. Not one of his friends said that Buposo's voice was ugly. Uh, here, there are important points to be made. First of all, if you notice that the friends never thought that his voice was ugly. It was only Bluebird himself. He somehow came to think that it was bad. And that's probably true with a lot of us that what we think is a reason for feeling inferior is not always the same. 
not always the same as how other people see you. So that is one point to remember whenever we think about our, our own sense of being inferior. Second point here is that the Bupos or the Bluebird found his stride, found his mission in that he was, he was, he felt saved, he felt accepted, and based on that, he found his stride and found meaning and purpose and joy in sharing whatever he had with others or being of benefit to others. In Buddhism, we talk about self-benefit and benefit for others. And so he was benefited by the owl, by being accepted. He found him, his core self. Then what did he do? He began to do something for others. He heard the teachings of the owl at nighttime. And then the following day, he would go out and share that with his friends. And he brought joy and joy and uh, uh, something that people learn from, uh, not people, but the other birds who, uh, who uh, benefited from the teachings that the bluebird shared. So that is the important uh, a part of, 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 the, of the message today, is that uh, by sharing, by going out into the community, that um, uh, we find a greater purpose and joy. And this is the concluding pa uh, page. And to, this, and to this day, the voice of Buposo can be heard every evening, quietly, deep in the forest. The end. So, how did you like the story? Um, it's uh, written, it is more of a picture book for children, but I think that it has a message for all of us. Um, it's told in a very simple manner, but it has a deeper message as I have been uh, sharing uh, in, in the way that I have been sharing with you. So let me uh, talk a little bit further about what this uh, story uh, can mean for us. When we take uh, teachings or hear Dharma talks, I would like for, well, I try to not only try to understand it in my own head as a kind of an intellectual endeavor, but a lesson for me personally. Buddhism is a first person religion. Well, most religions are first person. In other words, it's not knowledge. It's not science. Though science and knowledge are important, but it has to be applied to you on a first person level and to, to make sense on a personal level. So in taking the lesson or messages from the story, I thought about my own situation, applying it to my life experience. And when I speak of, when I think of inferiority, I go back to my childhood at the age of 10. When I was uh, living in Japan, but all of a sudden, my family, my mother and father, decided to move back to the US. My mother was born in Hawaii, so she was an American citizen. So after the war, the um, situation was better in the U.S. And my father wanted to 
uh, thought that he had a better opportunity uh, in the U.S., even though we, we, we were living uh, in rather comfortably in Japan. My mother worked for the American forces because she was bilingual, and um, at, in those days, working for the American army, the, the military, paid three times the salary of an average Japanese salaryman. So we live in a relatively large house uh, in the neighborhood, and people in the neighborhood thought we were, uh, we were relatively well off. And uh, I had uh, no uh, problem. I never uh, suffered from any kind of uh, economic uh, uh, distress. But all of a sudden, we decided to move to another country far away. It was a shock for me. So when I got there in September of 1958, three days later, my brother and younger brother and I, we had to go to school. We spoke no English and we didn't understand what was going on. But fortunately, my American classmates were very friendly and welcoming. And so that was, uh, was uh, the easy part. But a sense of inferiority continued to increase because I didn't speak the language. I was um, uh, a minority in uh, religious and ethnically and racially and, uh, and religiously. So uh, a few years later, after I got there, I began to go to a Buddhist temple. I had actually gone to a Christian church for about two years uh, as after I, uh, we arrived in, in the U.S. But somehow the Christian teaching and the situation didn't quite uh, settle well with me. The teaching that um, God created everything and and, and, and but for me, as I look around, there were a lot of issues and problems and suffering. There had been a war that had killed millions of people. And on top of that, here, I was in a situation where uh, uh, I had to adjust to a new culture, new language. And on top of that, my parents uh, did not get along very well. So I, fought, I, I, I heard them quarrel all the time. And so our family life was not very happy. So uh, I wondered why a God uh, who was omniscient, omnipotent, almighty, all-knowing, why didn't he do a better job in creating a world, a better, better world? So, when I had a chance to go to a Buddhist temple, um, I felt more comfortable because it seemed more realistic. If I felt that it made sense. It said, life is change, and often life doesn't go your way. I often say now, life is a bumpy road. Um, and these uh, teachings of impermanence, bumpy road, and that things are interdependent, they made sense to me. So I, I uh, felt comfortable uh, attending the Buddhist temple. And top of that, uh, most, of the pe most of the people who attended the Buddhist temple were of Japanese background. So that I felt comfortable uh, on that level as well. But even at the Buddhist temple, I felt a sense of inferiority because my Japanese American friends uh, spoke English perfectly. Their parents were well settled in, in the US. They lived in big house. Um, they took vacations. Whereas uh, initially we lived in a very small house and hardly ever took vacation. So all of these, all of these factors, these experiences um, uh, increased my sense of inferiority. 
However, as in the story, the, what I consider to be disadvantage turned to an advantage. So this is another important message. So when I began to go to college, I uh, began to study Japanese language. By then, my Japanese had really deteriorated to a point where I could hardly speak. Uh, certainly, I couldn't read very well, and I couldn't write very well. But at the university, I, um, I excelled compared to other kids because I had a step up on them. So my disadvantage or the reason why I felt inferior became a reason for uh, doing better than others and gave me a greater confidence. And so um, in a way, that was one aspect of finding myself, the unique self or distinctive self. I didn't need to be like others or compete with others uh, in areas that I was not good at. But that was one area that I was strong at and gave me a great sense of joy. Around that time, I began to consider uh, making Buddhism my career, either as a minister, as a scholar. And in doing so, I was able to do uh, well, uh, comparatively speaking, because of the advantage that I had, which initially was a source of my inferiority. So what that tells us is that um, it, if we can find a path, if we can find a profession, if we can find a, a work in which, which reflects you as a person, your distinctiveness, your uh, uh, specialness, then uh, the disadvantage, the reason for you, for you feeling inferior can be changed into a uh, reason for, uh, reason for uh, feeling much better about who you are. So, um, so the, uh, I wish to mention a little bit about a psychologist by the name of Alfred Adler. I don't know if you have heard of him. Um, he's not as famous as Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung. Uh, actually, those two plus Alfred Adler are considered the giants in the area of psychoanalysis. Uh, Alfred Adler lived from 1870 to 1937. So he lived, uh, oh, uh, about 60, he, he passed away at the age of around 67. Boy, it's, it's impressive, isn't it? Um, I'm already 72 and, uh, and he was only 67, but he accomplished so much and, and became a inspiration for a lot of psychologists after him. Some of the, uh, the well-known psychologists that I, I respect um, uh, were, were inspired by him. One of the things that Alfred Adler talked about was this sense of inferiority, that he himself uh, felt inferior as a child because he was uh, physically weak. He had become sick. Um, to a point where the doctor uh, thought that he was gone. He actually overheard him uh, telling his parents, uh, your son is gone or lost. And so that was a shock for him, I'm sure. But he fortunately um, uh, came through, pulled through, and um, uh, became uh, uh, the the person that he did become, but as a child, he was uh, had had this deep sense of of being inferior to others, which is the reason why uh, he 
they aspired uh, and tried harder. And this is another aspect of inferiority, other than the fact that, and, and I want to emphasize uh, this point that it's not only us who feel, only us who feel inferior, but almost everyone, in fact, everyone feels inferior, uh, especially when you're young, when you're a child compared to the adults, you, are not, you don't have the capacity and the abilities that they do. And then in school, as we grow up, we are often compared to others in terms of grades, in terms of uh, uh, you know, at, at, athletic uh, sports. And so not everyone is good in all fields. So we often com compare with others and feel inferior. But so it is found, it is something that all of us uh, feel. But Adler, uh, what he says is that um, inferiority is not necessarily bad, that it is the reason, it is the motivation to do better, to improve and find meaning and purpose and he calls, and, and so with the right kind of, uh, of support, the sense of inferiority can become the source for uh, uh, striving, and he calls it strive for significance, striving for significance. And, and so striving for meaning. And in so doing, you come to realize a sense of well-being and happiness. One other point that is very interesting is that his psychology is called individual psychology. And some people mistake that and feel that, well, he is uh, talking only about individuality and uh, self, you know, be, being concerned only with oneself. But actually, if individuality is uh, individual means to, to find your find who you are, realizing who you are, but in so doing, you must connect with a larger community, larger life. So uh, he is one of the first psychologists to, to really talk about the importance of community and how we become part of that community in order to find true happiness, true individuality, is not to be self-isolated and be self-isolated, but become part of the whole. Just like in the story, remember the blue bird found himself, but he just didn't stop there. He began to connect with others. He contributed to others' happiness. Just as Shinran Shonin too, after he found himself at the age of 29, and he was exiled. But uh, despite these difficulties, he began to share his teachings with others in the Kanto region. And then eventually uh, going back to Kyoto to continue his writing. So uh, you can see what Adler is talking about manifested in how Shinran Shonin found his happiness by um, uh, connecting with others. And ultimately, uh, connect others include not only community, social community, but also much greater uh, community or much greater life, which is expressed in our tradition as Amida. And actually this, what we call Amida, this, the, the inconceivable life and light ultimately, manifests in so many different ways to uh, when we awaken to that, when we um, come in touch with that, we are encouraged to, um, uh, to, to aspire uh, and taking, the, we are encouraged to change the sense of inferiority to something greater. You are given this energy and um, as I conclude, just allow me to say that when I was confronted by some of these uh, sense of inferiority, 
I recall being uh, motivated, moved and pushed by some, uh, some yearning to do better, the energy. You know, I could have given up. I could have said, oh, this, this country is not, not something I, I want. I never wanted to be here in the first place. But somehow there was this uh, push, supported energy that I received from my the school teachers, my classmates, my friends at the temple, my teachers who in one way or another um, gave me that energy, that support, which ultimately rests and we, what we call Amida Buddha. So I hope that on this occasion, as we celebrate uh, Shinran Shonin's birthday and his teachings, that you take note of the story that I had shared with you and to uh, look within to your sense of inferiority that, and that it is not something that is bad, but it is found in all people. And that with the realization of the compassion and wisdom of what we call Amida Buddha, uh, that we'll be able to find our stride and make a great life for ourselves and for others. Let's, let us close with Gasho, uh, putting our palms together in appreciation for what we uh, have, I, what we can learn and develop within ourselves for the betterment of ourselves and for others. Namo Amida Buddhas. Namo Amida Buddhas. Nam Manda, Nam Manda, Nam Manda, Nam Manda. Please have a great day, great evening, and hope to see you again. <laughs>